Welcome to the Manufacturing Matters Podcast with the Council of Industry. Join us as we bring you inspiring stories, interviews, and insights from across the Hudson Valley that will revolutionize the way you think about manufacturing. This podcast is proudly sponsored by PKF O'Connor Davies, a leading accounting and advisory firm dedicated to helping businesses thrive in the manufacturing sector. With their industry knowledge and strategic guidance, PKF O'Connor Davies ensures that manufacturers have the financial insights and support they need to achieve success. Dr. Bill Daggett, founder of the Successful Practices Network, welcome to the Council of Industry podcast. Uh, thank you, Harold. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate that. So, Tell us a little bit about the Successful Practices Network and a little bit about you know, your background and how you kind of got to be this person who is the kind of the go-to person for school reform in the country. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the Successful Practices Network is an organization of a 501c3, a not-for-profit, that gets lots of support from a lot of different groups to find and validate the nation's most successful schools, K-12, and somewhat in community colleges. And by we say successful, meaning preparing students, not only for success in school, but more importantly, for success in the world beyond school. My background, Harold, is I started as a tech ed teacher. I was a business education teacher. Uh, have an unusual background in that I, I have an education background, but I have an MBA and then a doctorate in education. So I kind of bounced around both worlds a little bit. Yeah. Went on to become a teacher, then an administrator at Alfred State College in New York, and went on to become a university professor at Temple University, went on to become the dean of Russell Sage College. And then the commissioner of education brought me into the state ed department. And it was during a time of real kind of trauma in American education because of something called the Nation at Risk, this report that said, you know, we're not competing well against Europe and Asia. Best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me the opportunity to really study deeply other nations' education programs mm. as well as look at our own. And it put me on the national scene and I began to do a lot of presentations around it. At the same time, I was heading up career and tech ed for the state ed department, but the commissioner soon moved me into having a broader role as a director over really curriculum and testing. And so I, I was walking both worlds, the academic world and the career and tech ed world. And then I, I, I left to create a company called the International Center for Leadership and Education, which was to identify and share best practices across the globe. And the Gates Foundation came to me and said, you know, we really would like to fund you to do a deep study on these best practices, but we only fund 501c3s, not for profits. So wow. I started so I started the successful practices network. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, we actually did something similar at the Council of Industry at the Center for Hudson Valley Manufacturing Workforce. Uh, that's that's our not for profit, same deal. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I've been off and running doing this now for 30 years and, and constantly having my ear to the ground of what's happening in the world beyond school so that we're preparing kids, again, not just for school, which I understand because I ran curriculum and testing for the right. state, but to make sure that what we're doing truly prepare kids. And during that period of time, we've seen a lot of changes primarily brought by technology, but Harold, most recently, AI. Right. AI is going to fundamentally and irreversibly change the American workplace and society. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that we've seen such, you know, I've been doing this not not quite as long as you, but around the same same length of time, you know, our workforce development programs and, and trying to close the skills gap and so forth. And the change that happened really with it, what we call Industry 4.0, you know, that kind of that internet connecting devices and machine learning type things, which is kind of the precursor to AI was, it seemed like it disrupted things dramatically overnight. <laughs> and, but that's like a decades long change. Uh, you know, I'm, it is, it's, this is so happening so fast. Yeah. 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 I, what in the past took about a decade with technology to change. 
and, and I call that the IT age, the information okay. technology age. It took about a decade. I believe we're leaving the IT age. I think we're entering the age of artificial intelligence. And what that will do in one to two years is what IT took 10 to 20 years to do. I okay. think the rate of change is about 10 times faster. Wow. And the real challenge is how agile can you be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And schools aren't known to be very agile. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it's. I think it's scary in business too. If it, they, that changed that fast, for sure. And I think you know there there is certainly a, a better reputation for being nimble in the business community. Yeah. yeah, and you know I think you're going to see a real shift in business too. And what I'm going to say next may surprise people. I think the smaller companies are actually going to be better at this than the bigger companies. Yeah, it's interesting be because the bigger companies have structures and systems <laughs> yeah. in the small cultures, dynamics, all those things that you got to overcome, right? Yeah. A small company can change on the dime. Okay. Yeah. If they're willing to. And, right. And okay. they see the opportunity. Yeah. So I think, I think we're going to see bigger change quicker in the smaller companies, but I think it's going to in general change the landscape. Most importantly, it's going to change the skills, knowledge, and attributes our students need. Deloitte just came out with a study. I was literally reading it this morning. Oh, really? Yeah, just came out. And what they had done is survey 2,800 business leaders across the country and basically said, if, if we don't, any company that does not embrace AI to bring efficiencies and effectiveness and change their workforce patterns, uh, they're not going to be able to compete over the next three or four years. Right. Right. And so you, you talk about career readiness and getting young people career ready, and that now is changing. Um, is it changing? I mean, is it is AI changing that so dramatically from from what it was 10 years ago? Or or is it, is it kind of the same? Maybe it's a little tweaked. It's presently kind of the same, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. Uh, I See, I, I think career ready is actually becoming more important than college ready. But, you know, in 2002, there was a national movement and it was called Race to the Top. Right. Uh, and we pushed, correct me so, during the Bush administration and, and, and changed a number of things. And, and schools created this byline, college and career ready. But, Harold, I don't think they really met it. They met college ready, next grade, next test, next level of education. For some kids, we'll give them a good CT program, CTE program. Recent years, we've begun to say, ah, oh, you know, P-TECH is even better, and it is, okay? <laughs> good BOSIS programs, good P-TECH programs, but most kids aren't in them. Right. I think where we're moving to, and this thing lets you know education pretty Carefully, this might be a little abstract, but for college ready, I believe from kindergarten on, we're doing it. Okay. And the capstone experience for the kids really headed to the universities are advanced placement and inter international baccalaureate programs in high school. Mm -hmm. I believe where we're moving to is that career in tech ed and P-TECH is a parallel in career ready to what IB and AP is in college ready. Mm. And I think we have those capstone programs. They need to constantly be tweaked because the workplace is constantly tweaking. What we don't have is the pre-K up grade 10, mm. the, the development of those earlier skills like we have in college ready. Right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm going back, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm going back to that the term I used to hear called tracking, uh -huh. where you had to pick a lane. Like we all, all criticized the German model because, you know, by the time you were yeah. you know, eight or 10 or whatever the number is, they were sending you towards trade school or towards college. And yeah. that was so un-American. Um, yeah. how, how do we overcome that? And is that is that even just something... We don't we don't have to overcome anymore. It's just so obvious that it that, that people have different attributes and different purposes in life. Yeah, I and I studied a lot the German system and, and the Japanese system. I, I I've looked at all those systems pretty carefully. I don't think we can emulate any of those, Harold, in our in okay. America. Our cultures are too different. 
There are some schools that really are beginning to do this around the country. All kids should be career ready. Yeah. And college is just an incremental step for some kids. And I think we're increasingly seeing the degree itself isn't as valuable as everybody thought it was. <laughs> Starting to see that, right? Yeah. What is valuable is do you have a credential? So like in college, really important. What you major in matters a lot. In the community colleges, which I think are really well positioned to take a lead here in this transformation, I think they should continue their associate programs, but the explosion is going to be in their in their individual certificate programs. Right. And that's going to be that partnership with business and industry. And if they don't do it, business and industry are going to have to do it themselves. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely see that as a real trend. And I know you you focus a lot on you know changing cultures in schools and education, but we've seen it with our local colleges here in the in the Hudson Valley, where the you know the senior people, you know the the presidents, the the deans, they see that this is the trend, that this is the way to do it. But they have two two obstacles that they seem to have to overcome. One is their rank and file, but the other is just particularly community colleges, the way they're compensated, you know, <laughs> the model still only pays them for matriculated students. Yeah, that's got to change. And that is a huge problem. And, and, and the faculty they are good people, Harold. Oh, but, honestly, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I actually put myself in, in their place as, as, as someone who loved English literature yeah. And, you know, now you tell me I got to teach, like, you know, how to write manuals and reading nonfiction, like yeah. IKEA instructions. I mean, that's horrible. I don't want to do that. That's not, that's not what I signed up for. Yeah. And, and it's human nature. Everybody supports change, Harold, until it impacts them. Oh, yeah. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, let, let's take the English language arts. I mean, we have to know how to write prompts. And it's not as that's easy as people think. Right, you're, talking, you're talking AI prompts, right? You got to write a prompt. And by the way, one of the best paying, fastest growing jobs out there are prompt engineers. Yeah. Okay. But writing a prompt is almost like writing computer code, but it's writing it in English. And so with my own background career in tech ed, I was pushing two, three, four years ago, really hard coding, really important major, you know, computer science, really important. You need these technical skills. Harold, you no longer need them. And that's what people don't can't put their head around because AI can take as long as you can describe something in English or your native language, whatever that is, AI can instantly do the translation into the computer code and so on. And so all these majors that we've all been pushing for suddenly aren't that important anymore, except this part of it. They learned how to write, in effect, the prompts. They, in effect, because that's what they had to do, they wrote the prompt to tell. Right. Uh, the Before they did the actual coding, right? They actually yeah. had to think of it as what they thought of as a prompt, right? Yeah. They just, the first part of what they were doing is now a critical skill for everybody. Right. Okay. And here's the central question Does that mean? That's a career in tech ed skill, or is that a language arts skill? Interesting, yeah. And yeah. it's a language arts skill, okay. Yeah. But for me, well, it is. I think, yeah, when you were talking about certain you know, the disciplines that are going to be most affected by artificial intelligence and you know prompt writing, yeah, it definitely they did look a lot like careers where you had to do a lot of writing, where you do have to do a lot of communication. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it is. Yeah, you heard me say this, and I, I think it's so true. What automation did to manual workers in the 20th century, AI is now doing the knowledge workers, but they're doing it at an accelerated pace. So where we had, you know, decades since a century, essentially, to adjust, you're talking about, you know, four or five years, which start like right now. Yeah. Yeah. The Deloitte study that I just mentioned a minute ago, 2,800 business leaders across the country and 17% of, of them said that AI would have a dramatic impact on their businesses in the next three months, 17%. 
48% then said it would have a dramatic impact, if not in the 17th, first three months, within the next year. Add the two together, that's 65% of all businesses. 99% of the 2,800 people said within three years, their businesses have to be transformed because of AI. 2,800 business leaders. And Deloitte, it is a very reputable oh, yeah. no, selling research group. So you got McKenzie and Deloitte. I think the best two research groups out there. Yeah. Coming so at McKenzie, it from... The McKenzie study you quoted talked about some of the skills. So you, you talked about prompt writing, which yeah. is you know a very specific skills. But you, you, it talked about, it was very intriguing. It, it, it talked about the different types of skills and like like there were four different ones is that yeah uh, yeah uh, uh said native skills still really really important i mean you got to have the foundational skills of reading writing and mathematics or you're dead <laughs> okay right. cognitive but then interpersonal skills and, and that included collaboration teamwork uh right. all those type of skills and then the self-leadership skills which are a lot about perseverance organizational skills, grit, mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. and then digital skills. In effect, what the McKenzie study clearly says is the worker has to be able to do what AI can't do because nobody is going to pay you to do what AI can do faster, more efficiently than a human being. Or you're not going to be in business. I, yeah, there might be a little bit of compassion for a little while and a little bit of but you know, ultimately, as people retire or they move around, it's it's going to happen. I mean, there there will be that transition. Harold, if you were starting a business tomorrow morning and you had nothing to worry about because you had a uh, in terms of present system structures personnel, you had a blank piece of paper, you'd be crazy not to start with AI. And right. so, the Deloitte study also says that there's going to be an explosion in new companies. Hmm. There are going to be people who Startups. are in other companies that leave because they can see incredible they opportunities. Can just do, absolutely. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, sure. Why not? Right. We actually see a little bit of this in the human resource world. We do a lot with our with our HR network. It's kind of a core of what, what our association does is support those programs. And the the AI factor in human resources, whether it's on the recruiting side, which is a little scary, and you know, there's there's definitely some problems to be worked out there. But on the benefits administration, just some of the the nuts and bolts stuff that happens in an HR department that any employee now can log in and get the answer. How much PTO do I have left? You know, what's what's our policy on? It's all readily available to them, and and, and it's just it is transformative. Yeah, let me ask you a question because you're you're closer to the manufacturing than I am, but by giving you a comparison, AI today, if you're a school administrator, and that's who I deal with mostly, two big tasks every year you got to go through is putting the master schedule together. <laughs> I got thousands of kids, I got a few hundred teachers, I got classrooms. How do I put it together? Okay. The other one is a bus schedule. You want to get in trouble as a school administrator? Mess up your bus schedule and see what happens to you. Been on both ends of that. Yep, know that. AI can do both. Sure. Uh, but written with the prompts written correctly, right? Prompts Make sure that all the variables are are in there. Please give me the best bus schedule. Uh, you know, for efficiency, for fuel efficiency, for time efficiency. For uh, yeah, I can see that. Now, aren't there similar? kind of task and functions in the private Absolutely. sector, AI Absolutely. can in, do it. Yeah, in the, in the manufacturing world, for sure. And and to a certain extent, you know, as part of the automation, and, and this is where I think it's a little more natural in the, the manufacturing world, because as part of the automation, you know, people have been employing ERP systems, and those ERP systems are now becoming more sophisticated and incorporating AI into them. So, yeah. you know, now you have machines learning a little bit about how they best interact with each other and when the best you can you know, input energy costs and those types of things into it. And, the, and you're starting to get your recommendations, whether you like it or not. You know, if you uh, run this machine from, you know, if you shut it off at eight o'clock and turn it on at 9.15, you'll save, you know, 48 cents on electricity per minute or something like that. Like, oh, well, that's great. 
so yeah, it, it, it is already happening and it's just a matter of how you incorporate it. And you know, to your point about the people who can interpret that and can you know edit that to, to say, mm -hmm. ah, you know, AI, you're right, except you're not, we haven't asked you to consider this factor yet. Yeah. <laughs> but also say, yeah, great idea. Well, let's do that. Yeah, and you just referred to it. really important because there are people who misinterpret the importance of having knowledge of whatever it is your field is, okay? Whatever your business is, it's actually absolutely critical because you can't be that sophisticated editor of AI if you don't know what it's supposed to have achieved. And so it's not going to replace the importance of engineers and, and doctors and pharmacists, everything. They're still really, really important. Yeah, I thought your example of the paralegal was was telling. You know, that was, and I think, you know, we in manufacturing have a lot of these middle skills jobs, and that's really where the skills gap is in, in things like, you know, tool maker, machinist, electromechanical technician. You know, these things are really require experience, expertise, working with it. But there are a lot of kind of those middle skill jobs that are more like research, calling together information, writing reports that just feel like those are the ones that are most, most under threat. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing is, again, I'm venturing into territory you know better than I do, but AI is going to enable you to have programmable manufacturing at a level we have never seen in the past to customize anything and everything almost instantly. And you have some of that already, but this is going to accelerate it. Yeah. You know, 25 years ago, Bill, there was a, a running joke. I'm sure it's still out there. It says the factory of the future is going to have one employee and a dog. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I've seen that. Right. So I've the, seen the, empl the employee's job is to feed the dog and the dog's job is to make sure the employee doesn't touch any of the machines. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think, you know, they, I, you, you just kind of see that in that full automation there. Yeah, um, you know, parallel in education. Uh, I, I deal a lot with the major publishers. They're mm -hmm. all fundamentally going to change. Because mm -hmm. right now, a publisher puts together a curriculum, and it's for all the kids. But in any classroom, you've got kids reading at different levels. you got kids with different math aptitudes. And you got kids with enormous difference in terms of interest. AI now... And every one of the publishers over the next two years, every one of them are moving across the board to this. They're not going to be selling. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn here. Well, I have, these are all books I've written. <laughs> okay. Not going to happen in the future. Yeah. It's not going to happen because everything's going to be personalized to the student, their area, of their, their reading level, their math level, and their area of interest. So what, you, what they're going to be buying are site licenses to use artificial intelligence-based curriculum that is personalized to every kid. And it yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And also, why not? Right? That seems to make the most sense. So and in the few minutes we have left, you know, talk about how that, you, that publishers, how does that affect teachers? I mean, it feels like, you know, I, I've had great teachers who are the ones that like literally that brought forth what you had in you, right? It helped you learn, shows you one corner and, and helped you figure out where the rest of the triangle was. How does that change? If we have individual learning programs, are they guides? Are they, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to I'll let, you, let you answer it. How, how will it change? Fundamentally change. It's going to be, for some educators, it's going to be exciting and some it's going to be very painful. It's going to change the role of teacher from providing students information and systems and, and, and policies, understanding, in other words, sharing that information. And what teachers in most classrooms do is share that information. And then they give the kids an assignment to go to try to apply as homework the information they share. This fundamentally changes it. It changes the role of teacher from sharing information and, and, and knowledge, in effect, teaching to managing learning, which is a fundamental shift. And the analogy I used was the medical field, how your general practitioner used to provide you medical care. They don't provide the care anymore. 
they use data systems and information and differentiated staffing and mm -hmm. they manage your uh, medical care. Somebody else actually provides it, the PA, the nur uh, nurse practitioner, the specialist. That's the change in role in, for educators. And for some educators, that's going to be really, really painful. And you know who's going to be better at it? The non-academic teachers. Think about what a coach does. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Think about what the music director and the band director do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Think about what a good CTE teacher does. Right. Yeah. It's the non-academic teachers are going to be more comfortable because it's more consistent with what they do. Right. And especially in our highest performing high schools, where I think sometimes the teachers think of themselves almost as college professors, <laughs> it's not going to work. It's right. simply not going to work. And our kids are so wedded to this technology, they're going to expect that change. Yeah, that's fascinating. Just one more thing before I let you go. Along that line, you know, taking that one step further, how do the way we train teachers, how does that change? You know, my parents were teachers. My wife was a teacher. We, they all, you know, SUNY New Paltz, Grapes program, you know, all graduated from there, master's degrees in education. You have a doctorate in education. It's not, uh, the, way they, <laughs> not the way we never taught. Yeah, there's there's two parts to that answer. Number one, the state certification requirements have to change. Okay, fair enough. The, the, the certification hey, requirements. Ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell the universities what they have to make yeah. uh, their students do. And so culture trumps strategy. We got to change the whole culture and mentality. But number two, it, it's less about what we call pedagogy. Okay, yep. And more about practical experiences. Interesting. Quite honestly, Harold, if we were doing a great job in training educators, I wouldn't have a business. <laughs> yeah. I got yeah. a couple hundred consultants that are busier than can be because the system isn't figuring out how to prepare teachers for this changing world. It's a yeah. fundamentally different approach. Yeah. Dr. Bill Daggett, I could talk to you all morning, but I know you have um, more important work to do, and uh, we appreciate your time um, very much. And uh, thank you so much, and continue the good work. Thanks, Harold, and thanks for what you're doing to get the word out, and uh, let us know if we can help you in any way. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Manufacturing Matters, brought to you by the Council of Industry and sponsored by PKF O'Connor Davies, accountants and advisors who understand the unique challenges and opportunities in the manufacturing sector. We hope you gain valuable insights and inspiration from today's discussion. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform.